to the Mailman School of Public Health, Linda Freed. Good morning. Could I invite everybody to take their seats? We have such an exciting day ahead of us. I had the opportunity to greet many of you at last night's really remarkable event honoring Alan Rosenfield and the act of courage based on knowledge. It was an inspiring occasion for me and I hope you will find that it aptly set the stage for our deliberations, our work, and our collaboration over the next two days. Now, I have the real profound pleasure and honor on behalf of the Association of Schools of Public Health, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health of welcoming you to the conference, the working conference, on the changing landscape in global public health. I can guarantee when I look at who is here in the room that we have more inspiration ahead of us today because of all of you. We have this morning to start us off and frame the day and our aspirations and goals, one of the most distinguished and eloquent speakers whose great intellect always brings clarity and insight to the challenges facing our time. It is my really deep pleasure and an honor to introduce to you the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Judith Roden. Dr. Roden is the 12th president of the Rockefeller Foundation, an organization which will celebrate its centennial in 2013 and has perhaps the most distinguished legacy in public health throughout the world. The Rockefeller Foundation's very first grant was to an organization known as the American Red Cross. Over the years, it was Rockefeller that made the investments which served to bring plagues such as hookworm and malaria under control. Whether it is improved food production worldwide, the Green Revolution, which is credited with saving more than a billion lives around the world, the centrifuge, the electron microscope, the computer, or schools of public health around the world, they each have one thing in common, and that is their root and their fruits, which lie in strategic visionary investments by the Rockefeller Foundation. Today, among its many global and global health initiatives, Rockefeller is focusing on the transformation of health systems so as to make health care more accessible, effective, and affordable worldwide and to accomplish health for the world's populations. Further, they are linking global disease surveillance networks so as to minimize the spread of infectious diseases that can lead to pandemics while improving the monitoring, detection, and the response to infectious diseases such as Ebola, SARS, and avian influenza. The Rockefeller Foundation successfully engages the private sector to work with the public sector in developing policies and practices to provide and finance health services for the poor. And it affirms its pioneering philanthropic mission by supporting and shaping innovations to ensure that more individuals, communities, and institutions access the benefits of globalization while strengthening its resilience to globalization's known and multiple risks. Approaching such complex challenges with bold global solutions is the Rockefeller Foundation trademark and one that is carried forth today in the same spirit under Judith Roden's exemplary leadership. Judith, as many of you know, was the first woman to lead an Ivy League institution as president of the University of Pennsylvania. Earlier, she served as chair of the psychology department, then dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Yale University, and ultimately the provost at Yale. It was at Yale where she conducted her own groundbreaking research in aging and health, social, environmental, behavioral, and psychological factors in obesity and in aging-related outcomes, eating disorders, and really as a leader in thinking about 
women's health, including from the perspective of her contention that women's health has unique risk factors and modifiers, which I think we would, meant we would all now agree with, and that gender roles and change in gender roles have profound effects on the gender differential and mortality rates as well as morbidity. And in her seminal work in beginning in 1990, the issue of unique issues regarding AIDS for women. Her analyses were prescient regarding a number of the questions ahead of us today and tomorrow, such as the interactions of biological and behavioral characteristics, how they modify each other's risk effects and their joint effects on health, and how health systems must operate at all levels of society. Judith has published well over 200 articles and chapters in academic publications and has authored a number of books, including one of my own favorites, The University and Urban Revival, Out of the Ivory Tower and Into the Streets. Her work in aging, in particular, influenced the trajectory of my own career and informed significantly my own translational research on the subject. Thank you, Judith. Judith is home whenever she's with us, having earned her PhD here at Columbia in 1970 and being the leader, of course, for all of us of the Rockefeller Foundation's public health future. We are profoundly grateful to her for being with us this morning and agreeing to deliver the conference's official welcome address. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Judith Roden. Thank you, Dean Freed, for that extraordinary and very, very generous introduction. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to see so many of you here. I also want to acknowledge uh, some of my own Rockefeller colleagues, Jack Rowe, who is a member of our Board of Trustees, Ariel Pablos Mendez, um, who is leading our work in health, one of our managing directors, uh, and my special assistant, Ted Grant. Um, Linda, thank you for reminding me uh, how wonderful it was to work on all of these areas and uh, what a great future we all have together in considering this work um, and all of the work that we do together. And um, thank you for your leadership of the Mailman School, uh, which has been really pioneering the frontiers of public health for more than 90 years. Uh, I also have to salute you, Linda, for um, last night's tribute to Alan Rosenfield. I think anyone who was lucky enough to know Alan knows that he possessed not just a brilliant mind, but really such a wonderful character. Um, and all of us know what a difference he made to so many lives worldwide, especially for mothers in developing country, countries, maybe um, the all too often forgotten M in MCH. We've gathered today to talk about the changing landscape of global public health and to create a new vision, a vision for public health leadership in the 21st century. But I guess I'd like to start, I guess as Linda did a bit, by taking us back to the start of the 20th century because we need to remind ourselves of the distance we've traveled and the spirit that brought us this far. In the early 1900s, health challenges were among the greatest burdens to society, even in the United States. I don't have to remind this audience that in those times, medicine was probably more of an art than a science. Bloodletting was still a commonplace treatment. Diseases like TB and typhoid ran rampant. Antibiotics were still unimagined. And rural areas suffered devastating illnesses of their own, such as hookworm an insidious, debilitating disease that ravaged poor communities in particular. Hookworm was the consequence of primitive plumbing, poor soil and water treatment, and the lack of footwear. But the disease was more than an individual affliction. It was a community affliction. It sapped victims' energy, leaving them unable to learn or work, contributing to southern states' impoverishment at the start of the 20th century. And then, 101 years ago this week, a revolutionary change got underway. On October 26, 1909, thanks to a million dollar gift from John D. Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission for the Eradication of Hookworm was established. <clears throat> Over a five year period, 
from 1910 to 1914, a team of doctors and nurses and health officials led a vigorous public health campaign to eliminate this scourge of the poor. Education was considered as important a part of the campaign as was treatment. Public school systems and the press were enlisted alongside medical professionals. The effort led to the eradication of hookworm and certainly was one of the great public health accomplishments of the century. This winning formula of scientific innovation plus strategic implementation was captured in the Welsh Rose Report of 1915 and helped inspire in 1916 the Rockefeller Foundation's establishment of the world's first school of public health at Johns Hopkins University, as well as our support for medical education reform through the work of Abraham Flexner. My predecessors didn't use the word innovation. They called their work scientific philanthropy. But innovation was surely their game. It was bold and daring. It was intrepid and risk-taking. And they weren't alone. Take Dr. Sarah Josephine Baker, a physician here in New York City, who was appointed director of the city's new Bureau of Child Hygiene in 1908. She developed programs for midwife training, basic hygiene, and preventive care. She created the Little Mothers League to teach young girls how to properly care for their infant siblings. She promoted health education in immigrant neighborhoods, distributed milk to children, and created a school health program that was then copied in 35 states. By the time she retired in 1923, New York City had the lowest infant mortality rate of any major American metropolis. And just consider this, for the vast majority of Dr. Baker's career, American women didn't even have the right to vote. Talk about bold and daring. Of course, today much has changed. We've seen many public health advances in the last century. Life expectancy doubled, infant and maternal mortality declining throughout the world, eight of every 10 people living in countries where poverty is declining. And yet, significant challenges persist. They test our approaches, our focus, and our resources. Our work on the old problems remains unfinished. Take the hookworm example again for a moment. While hookworm has been effectively unhooked in much of the developed world, the disease remains the world's leading cause of anemia and protein malnutrition, afflicting an estimated 740 million people in developing nations. Or take child mortality. A baby girl born in New York today can expect to live until 82, the highest life expectancy in recorded city history. Dr. Baker would surely be thrilled. And yet today, a baby girl born in Sierra Leone can only hope to make it to her 40s. Those kinds of disparities, as we know, exist not only among countries, but within them, reflecting the persistence of economic and social inequities that tend to hurt most those who are the most vulnerable. Meanwhile, as global lifestyles evolve, new challenges are creating new stresses. Obesity is reaching epidemic proportions and non-communicable diseases are rising dramatically. Even in developing countries, we see the impact of behavior and lifestyle, such as increased tobacco use, poor diet, and obesity, leading to a rising toll in diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The health services needed for all these growing burdens are not accessible in many places in the world, or they are paid for out of pocket, which can mean the consequences of a medical crisis leading to financial catastrophe for many families. Add this all up, and it seems that global public health is surely ready for another revolutionary idea. At the Rockefeller Foundation, we're continuing to do our best to help ignite that bold spirit of progress. In looking systemically at global health, we and others have found that despite impressive vertical efforts against priority problems, such as TB, HIV, malaria, it is the health systems that are ailing and weak. Symptoms take the form of poor stewardship, dysfunctional service delivery, and inequitable financing, 
and are especially acute in developing countries where near, nearly 10 million children die every year from mostly addressable causes. As USAID Administrator Ra Shah said recently, and I quote, visit any African country and you're likely to find a health system organized around diseases and interventions, not around the actual patients. You'll find separate clinics in separate places for AIDS, for children's health, family planning, and obstetric care. Not only is that bad for patients, but it is strikingly inefficient for taxpayers, and in many cases, we have only ourselves to blame." End quote. And let's be honest, when it comes to healthcare access and healthcare quality, we know that the discrepancies that burden the poor are not limited to developing countries. While global spending on health has increased to some $7 trillion annually, access to affordable quality services has not, including here in the United States. Yet new technologies and demographic, epidemiologic, and economic shifts are transforming health systems around the world. And therefore, there is a window of opportunity to promote strategies that steer this transformation toward better health outcomes and financial protection. That's why Rockefeller has made transforming health systems our next revolutionary goal, around which we hope to promote much needed innovation, broker robust partnerships, and find sustainable, scalable solutions. Improving human resources and bolstering specific health services are certainly critical to this enterprise. To that end, we're supporting governments with the technology, the talents, the tools, and the training to become better stewards of their own national health systems and improve planning, financing, and quality of services. But that will not be enough. To measurably improve the health status and financial resilience of the poor, we also need to transform health financing at the country level. Consider this. Beyond the perils of disease, more than 150 million individuals worldwide face catastrophic healthcare expenditures. And as a result, approximately 25 million households are pushed into poverty every year. High out-of-pocket expenditures also prompt parents to withdraw their children from school, using education fees to cover medical costs. The world's poorest people pay the highest percentage of their wealth for health. The World Bank reports that in low-income countries, out-of-pocket spending accounts for 93% of private spending and more than 60% of the total healthcare spend. And while on average, only 5% of people fall gravely ill in a given year, the lack of insurance and effective social protection programs means that these are the people who are paying the lion's share of the national health spending bill. We are convinced that an indispensable ingredient of strengthening health systems is working towards universal health coverage, defined as access to appropriate health services for all at an affordable cost. So I'm really happy to see that the transformation of health systems and achieving universal health equity in healthcare is one of the key tracks of this conference. Even in low-income countries, universal health coverage is not merely laudable, it is possible. Just look at Ghana, which invested approximately $115 million over six years to establish their new health system, boosting coverage from 40% to 70% of the population. Or take Andhra Pradesh and India, which invested 60 million, 60 million over a three-year period of reform during which time coverage was extended from 10% to 85% of the population. In both cases, the individual investment amounted to 2.5% of the total health expenditure for several years. The result, a plummet in out-of-pocket expenditures from nearly 60% to only 30% total. We at the Rockefeller Foundation believe that the international community should share and learn from successes like these. We're facilitating cross-border learning through a joint learning network on universal health coverage. 
Earlier this year, we brought together health officials from Ghana, Vietnam, Rwanda, India, Indonesia, and the Philippines for a workshop in Delhi to trade best practices and new ideas for implementing universal health coverage. We're supporting new research on the global macroeconomics of universal health coverage and comparative health systems analyses. And we've convened a global task force on universal health coverage made up of national and multilateral leaders in an effort to share and to align institutional efforts on universal health care in low and middle income countries. But as countries renegotiate their social contracts for health, I believe that you, individuals leading public health, have an important opportunity to innovate. After all, universal health coverage will depend on good ideas, on research, and robust science, as well as capacity building to support its implementation. These ideas and initiatives will not be born out of biomedical laboratories. Rather, they will emerge from the field of public health. And who better to drive that endeavor than institutions of learning like yours like, and from leaders like you, with your expertise in health economics and policy and services, and your commitment to social justice. So given our convening today and tomorrow by one of the world's premier schools of public health, and the fact that this gathering represents some of the sharpest and most innovative minds in the field, let me challenge all of you to be bold and intrepid. The times demand this. And to ask yourselves, what revolutionary contribution will you in public health make in 2010, in the decade coming, in the century still unfolding? Society's needs and demands are taking shape in new opportunities that you can seize, including the global strategy for women and children's health, with pledges for more than $40 billion over the next five years, or President Obama's $63 billion global health initiative, which aims to partner with countries to improve health outcomes through strengthened health systems. The Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria is trying to become a more holistic support vehicle, now supporting health systems research and health systems outcomes as well. And under the leadership of Francis Collins, the NIH has listed health sector reform among his top five priorities. With the United States still accounting for half of the world's funding for health research, changes at the NIH can help drive health systems research at the global level. But this could mean merely more clinical trials under the banner of comparative effectiveness, and they are important indeed, but they are not sufficient. Unless experts and advocates like all of you here drive efforts to expand the scope, we will not achieve the effort that we are trying to accomplish. You have the leadership platform to make the most of these opportunities and to mobilize real social change under the banner of public health. Assert that leadership to assure that principles and services that public health stands for are incorporated into the blueprints for global health in the 21st century. And let's take inspiration again from the example of Alan Rosenfield, who would have been so energized to see all of you here today. I remember a story about Alan as his own health was failing, described him lying on his office couch with the machine pushing air into his lungs, and his determination to keep working as hard and as long as he had left. In his words, there is still so much to do. He was right, so let's do it. Thank you. Judith, thank you. That was, um, as we expected and hoped, uh, an exciting charge to all of us to try, attempt in the next two days uh, to rise to your challenge and to um, really provide leadership on the key issues of, that are confronting us both now and in the coming decades. It's my pleasure um, as part of the opening today to uh, recognize my 
and our colleagues in the design of what we hope really will be a visionary conference drawing on all the immense expertise in the room to, to answer Judith's challenge. And so I'd like to, um, first of all, invite up the people and, or, and representatives of organizations that partnered with us in starting what is now a process. Um, and in, welcome to the podium, Peter Piot, the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the dean, excuse me, Peter, and um, Harrison Spencer, the president and CEO of the Association of Schools of Public Health in the US. May I invite you up just to welcome everyone? And while they're coming up, <laughs> Please come and say hi. <laughs> While they're coming up, I, I'll say that uh, we have been working together now for two years. Um, and today's meeting is part of what we hope will be an ongoing process of working together with everybody in this room and expanding numbers of people to accomplish the goals that we address and set over the next two days. Peter? Thank you very much, Linda, and uh, good morning, everybody. Well, first of all, thank you, Linda, um, for your vision and for your, also for your courage to take on a, uh, what looked in the beginning as kind of an impossible task, and that is what's needed, and that is to transform public health, how we think about it, how we practice it, how we teach about it. Thank you for that, and so that's, uh, I think, how we should look at this, uh, this conference. And thank you also, Richard Parker and your team for making it possible. Um, we at the uh, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine are really not only uh, pleased, but also be very proud to be a partner in this uh, adventure, I would say. Um, in, in Europe also, there is a start of some thinking of uh, uh, how we should adapt uh, public health, global health, to the 21st century, and I'm very pleased that Antoine Flau is somewhere here in the, uh, in the audience. He's the president of the Association of Schools of Public Health of the European region. Now, the world is changing at an unprecedented uh, speed, and so is health. So the landscape is truly uh, changing, and it's tr uh, changing in a sense, in, often in paradoxical ways. On the one hand, the world is becoming far more uh, convergent, but also inequalities and uh, divergence are also increasing at the same time. We've seen not only the greatest progress in life expectancy, uh, in uh, child survival of the last uh, 50 years, but the last decade there has been um, an incredible momentum of interest and action on health globally. And driven by basically two things, or three things. One, the AIDS movement. Two, um, the awareness that health is not only uh, a cost but also an investment and has become far more political than before. Some of us don't like that, some of us welcome it and we have to um, really make sure that we make the best out of it. And also driven by Generation We, the new generation of young people that are putting pressure all over, I would say, high income countries in uh, doing more on, um, on health globally. And uh, at the same time, there's the phenomenon of globalization of higher education. Now, global health is a new term. I started my career in tropical medicine. We come all from very different angles here. The, the term global health didn't even exist. Um, and we still can discuss what does it cover. It's covering both a field of study, of inquiry, and an area of action. Now, public health is a crucial element of um, the global health movement and of global health as it provides both the science, the evidence and the experience and the practice, the approaches for improving the health of populations as a whole. But there's also a new paradigm of global health that is uh, emerging um, and which I think goes back to the roots of public health, the 19th century when we didn't have much technology. Um, and I feel that this global health uh, new paradigm is a unifying um, movement in the sense that it's bringing together multiple disciplines. Um, and as um, my friend Mike Merson says often, global health is a big tent with multiple disciplines providing this essential 
uh, contributions to improve the health um, of populations. Um, public health is often in the lead, but sometimes it's medicine. Look what the availability of antiretroviral therapy has done for public health and for global health in terms of uh, uh, survival of people with HIV. Sometimes it's the engineers. Think of water and sanitation, agriculture, business, and so on. So the, the boundaries of public health and of global, of global health are not defined yet, and maybe we should leave it that way. That's fine. Um, and we must also acknowledge that there are sometimes uh, differences in, in opinion, and I think that's all very good. But let's um, agree on some of the common uh, or the basis of a, a common vision. Um, and I would just like to give five elements and then I'll stop. The first one is that um, global means local and everywhere else. Uh, walking around in, in, in Manhattan here, it's the United Nations are in the street. And um, in contrast to international health and what some people think of global health, it's not only thousands of kilometers away or miles away, but it's really something where we have to integrate the local and, and the global. Uh, it means also that we should stop talking about we have study sites here and there. No, we're part of a, you know, of a network and we're strengthening each other's institutions and learning from each other wherever we are is key. Secondly, that is not, there's no single discipline that is really going to make it. It is the synergy of various disciplines. The problem is that um, our world is not made for multidisciplinary funding and career development and, and, and research and so on, but we have to change that. Um, and it means also that we have to recognize, many of us come from a health background, that non-health system um, factors are so important in, as determinants of health. Thirdly, is that the uh, common goal is really is the health of people el elsewhere, everywhere, but that it's all about inequities and resolving these inequities. Fourth point, and science is our basis, and lastly, and this is um, also, I would say, the legacy of, um, of Alan Rosenfeld, is that it's not only about evidence-based policies. It's evidence informed by human rights and health as a right. And I think that's one of the main things that I've learned from, uh, from Alan. So this conference, I believe, will be a success if we set out a roadmap, not only of the propositional questions, because wisdom starts with asking the right questions, but also by agreeing on the next steps for this transformational journey that we are uh, starting now and uh, reminding that Judy challenged us to be bold. But I think looking at the room who's here, we are all bold people here and we'll make it. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, good morning. Uh, the Association of Schools of Public Health represents the 46 accredited schools of public health in the United States in Mexico as well as the seven institutions in the United States, Canada, and France seeking accreditation. We're delighted to be uh, co-sponsoring this landmark conference, The Changing Landscape of Global Public Health. I'm joined today by a number of deans of schools of public health, including a number of our board and global health uh, committee leaders. Accredited schools of public health are heavily involved in global health, and many are the lead college in their university for these activities. All have international students, many domestic students are interested in global health. Most schools have a department or a center focused for global health and most have global research activities and collaborative relationships. While virtually all accredited schools of public health have MPH tracks or specialties in global health, several have moved recently to globalize their entire curriculum so that all students are exposed to global health perspectives. The idea for this conference began with a conversation by the ASPH Global Health Committee. There was a recognized need for a different paradigm and approach to global health in schools of public health. A plan emerged to remember and honor Alan Rosenfield through an innovative conference that brought to together global health thought leaders. Alan was a friend and a mentor to so many of us. And as we heard so clearly in the wonderful evening last night, more than anything, Alan was a person of great compassion who was passionately committed to global health equity and social justice. He would have definitely approved of this conference. 
We certainly would not be here to, today without the superb leadership of Dean Linda Freed. Her extraordinary commitment and determination, and I underline that word determination and vision, have been so crucial. Without her efforts, uh, this certainly would not have happened. Thank you very much, Linda. Richard Parker and, and so many of the other faculty and staff from the Columbia Mailman School have worked tirelessly to bring this meeting to reality. As well, a planning group of many global health thought leaders has importantly helped shape the agenda and contributed background papers. And again, th thanks to you. As part of the planning uh, process, um, and recently published in The Lancet, a number of deans of schools of public health reflected on the tenets of a redesigned global health system that could accomplish optimum health for populations. These include global health is public health and public health global health for the public good. Dedication to better health for all with particular attention to the needs of the most vulnerable populations and a basic commitment to health as a human right. An evidence-based systems approach to health promotion and disease prevention that examines broad determinants of health and creates integrated approaches. Commitment to an interdisciplinary approach and collaborative teamwork to analyze prob problems of populations. Multi-level systems-based interventions deployed to address the interactive con contributions of societal and health governance issues, corporate responsibilities, and environmental, behavior, and biological risk factors and a comprehensive frameworks for, for financing and structuring health policies that support community-based and clinical prevention integrated with healthcare delivery. These tenets reflect a nuanced and contemporary perspective that emphasizes interdependence and recognizes the many contributions of both resource-scarce and resource-rich nations. With the new understanding that many health problems have a linked etiology and a common impact, and that innovative solutions can come from all sectors, collaborative relationships become at a minimum bi-directional and optimally multilateral. This contemporary perspective has implications for education and research. It implies the need to examine and redesign all health profession education, particularly medicine, nursing, and public health, to better emphasize interprofessional education and population perspectives. As well, multilateral approaches to research imply need to consider the way global health research questions are framed, how funding streams are allocated, how relationships are structured, and how results are translated into interventions. This is a seminal conference that will help us reflect thoughtfully on global health in the 21st century and on many of these issues. ASPH is very pleased to co-sponsor we look forward to the discussions and to the outcomes. Thank you very much. And now it's my really great pleasure to introduce the person who led the charge in bringing all of the vision to action in, in the form of this conference. So it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Parker, who is chair of the orga conference organizing committee, uh, the cracker of the visionary and the action-oriented whip, and a professor of sociomedical sciences here at Columbia's Mailman School. Richard. Before anything else, let me also add my words of welcome to those of all the speakers who have preceded me. Uh, this meeting has been nearly two years in the making, and we're extremely grateful to everyone who's participated in the planning process, and above all, to all of you who have traveled in, in many cases, great distances to be with us here today. I want to comment quickly on the goals, processes, and outcomes that we hope to achieve during the short time that we have together. When we began the planning process, a number of things seemed clear about the current state of the field of global health that warranted further reflection and convinced us that yet another meeting on a subject that has already been discussed in so many recent meetings might nonetheless be worth the effort. It was obvious, for example, that a massive explosion of this field has taken place over the course of the past two decades. 
Thanks to the work of Christopher Murray and his colleagues, we know that international development aid for the area of global health has risen from $5.6 billion in 1990 to $21.8 billion in 2007. This massive influx of funding has been accompanied by a veritable population explosion in new global health initiatives, in academic centers for training and investigation, in discrete research studies, in voluminous publications, and so on. Global health is all the rage, and it seems likely that the rapid expansion of this field will only continue to grow in the medium to long-term future. That said, as is the case in almost any rapidly expanding field, the pace of events often moves more quickly than our ability to accompany them with analysis and critical thinking. The velocity of scale-up often advances more quickly than we can mount a conceptual architecture capable of accounting for the events taking place around us. And the need to periodically step back, uh, to, to step back from this flurry of activity in order to take stock of where the field is and where it is going, and to reflect critically on the key challenges that we confront is especially important. This is perhaps all the more true in the field of global health than in many other rapidly expanding areas, precisely because of the nature of some of the most important dilemmas currently facing this field. Just as the language of global health is relatively recent, taking place largely over the course of the past decade, the articulation of a conceptual framework for the field is still in its infancy. The extent to which a global health framework has been elaborated and articulated in ways that represent a true paradigm shift in relation to earlier notions of tropical medicine or even international health is questionable at best. It often seems that we have simply relabeled or rebranded earlier conceptual frameworks rather than having actually articulated a new conceptual architecture capable of taking account of the changes that have been taking place in the global system and of truly engaging with the profound interdependence that characterizes the globalized world of the early 21st century. Intellectual limitations that have prevented us from fully implementing a true paradigm shift from the framework of international health to one of global health have of course been accompanied by distortions and disjunctures that continue to exist in relation to both resources and power within the field of global health. While many of the most important challenges that have been the focus of the field have been concentrated in resource poor settings and in the global south, much of the influx of new financial support and the continued center of gravity in terms of policy making and decision making has continued to be centered primarily in the global north. Those most affected by policies and decisions have all too often had little input into the thinking behind them and little ability to influence the kinds of programs and approaches that have been prioritized. In short, there is still much that needs to be done to make this field a truly global one in every sense of the word and to achieve a more fundamental paradigm shift in ways that will make the field of global health distinct from earlier conceptions of international health. Meaningful public health thinking and practice about the possible population level solutions to our most pressing global health problems can and must make central contributions to bringing about these transformations. That said, the many changes that will be needed in order to confront the large issues facing this field can hardly be achieved through one short two-day meeting. We need to have a good deal of humility about our ability to influence such complex changes. Yet they nonetheless provide a backdrop against which the planning of this meeting has taken place. And it is surely in relation to these large backdrop issues that our discussions will unfold over the course of the next two days together. They've guided our thinking through the planning process, including a key planning meeting that was held in early March of this year, a meeting that many of you present here today also participated in. One of the most important outcomes of that meeting was a clear message to avoid organizing another fairly traditional conference made up of scientific presentations, keynote speeches, and the like, and to opt instead for a more interactive, inclusive, 
and hopefully innovative approach aimed at bringing together key leaders in the field of global public health from diverse sectors as well as from diverse regions to seek to open up new discussions and debates about the challenges facing this field both in the present and in the future. Special emphasis was given to including a wider range of constituencies and stakeholders than is often able to be present in such discussions, as well as new voices and perspectives that are not always represented in some of the existing fora where such issues typically are discussed. Emphasis was also given to trying to create spaces for interaction and debate that would possibly go beyond the limits of a one-off event and make this meeting a step in a longer process that might extend beyond it through some kind of ongoing activity aimed at creating more inclusive involvement in the development of new conceptual frameworks, the discussion of policy priorities, and the design and implementation of programs aimed at bringing about population-level solutions to the greatest global health challenges. These are the kinds of issues and reflections that have brought us to the program that we will engage in together during the next two days. In order to have a shared point of departure for these discussions, a number of background papers were developed by people involved in the planning process to offer a sense of some of the biggest questions facing the field. We specifically asked authors not to worry about trying to write exhaustive review articles covering all of the available literature on any given subject but rather to try to be provocative in raising issues and challenges that we need to confront and that we hope the discussions at this meeting will help us to think through more effectively. Much of the morning of this first day of the meeting will be dedicated to very brief presentations of these papers. As a way of stimulating discussion, of getting the ball up in the air for debate, we have also asked two meeting participants to serve as discussants for each of these papers commenting on the issues that they raise, or raising new issues that they may think the background papers have failed to address. The hope is that these sessions will serve a kind of warm-up purpose, getting our thinking going and helping us to move us in directions and into the discussions that will take place during the remainder of the meeting. As a second exercise, also intended to help us think together more effectively, right after lunch, we will also have a panel discussion, bringing together speakers who come from a number of the different key constituencies that we view as crucial actors in the field. Policymakers, educators, researchers, practitioners, advocates, and private sector actors. We've asked each of the panelists to speak from their own positions within the field of global public health about the issues under discussion and about the ways in which different constituencies can contribute to thinking through the field and to developing answers to its most pressing questions and avenues for intervention and program implementation aimed at confronting the greatest challenges facing the field. Following these initial sessions, in much of the rest of the meeting, we will be working in breakout discussion groups. The first of these groups will be this afternoon in which we have asked the members of different constituencies represented here at this meeting to meet with others from their constituency to discuss a range of issues raised in the earlier sessions and to think together about the ways in which different actors in the field can contribute in relation to these issues. While it will all already have been a long day, at the end of the afternoon we will also have a chance to be together in a more informal setting at a reception that will be held here on the Columbia campus at our faculty house, where other members of the local Columbia community will also be able to join us. There will be brief remarks by one of our own university's most distinguished faculty members working on these issues, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, as well as by Mr. Anand Grover, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health and Director of the HIV AIDS Unit for the Lawyers Collective in India, who could not be with us for the full meeting because of obligations at the United Nations General Assembly today, but who kindly offered to join us this evening. Tomorrow morning, we will begin the day with a number of brief synthesizing remarks made by meeting participants who we have asked to follow the discussions during the first day of the meeting and, again, from the different positions and perspectives that they have to make observations about the proceedings and about the kinds of issues that it would be most worthwhile to pursue during the second day of discussions. 
After the synthesizing comments, we will again break into working groups, this time organized not by constituency, but rather by the thematic areas that were identified at the planning meeting. These groups have been assigned with the goal of mixing people up, and we recognize that this is an imperfect process and that at least some participants will very possibly not be in the group that they would ideally choose for themselves. But we would ask you to bear with us in recognition of the fact that it is often in unexpected spaces or combinations that some of the most innovative ideas and thinking takes place. Following these second working group discussions, we will also have a very brief discussion of at least one of the ideas that has emerged as a possibility for a way in which we might seek to extend these conversations beyond the confines of these two days together through the development of ongoing knowledge networks developed in relation to these thematic areas. I would only emphasize here at the outset, as I will try to suggest tomorrow as well, that this is simply one possible idea among others that might emerge from our time together and is intended solely as a possible way forward and not in any way to close off thinking about other possibilities that meeting participants might wish to pursue. Finally, in the afternoon of day two of the meeting, we will have one last opportunity to come together in smaller discussion groups, this time organized with some greater flexibility and choice on the part of meeting participants about the kinds of issues that they think might be pursued after the end of this meeting and the ways in which they might wish to engage in such ongoing discussions. At the end of the second day, it is our deep hope that even if we have not been able to answer all or perhaps any of the questions that we set out as the focus for this meeting, we will at least have been able to air multiple perspectives and diverse analyses in ways that will have helped us to advance our thinking along lines that might not have been possible if we had not come together in this way. While we want to maintain a sense of all due humility about what can be achieved in any two-day meeting, we nonetheless maintain the conviction shared by many here today, I think, that bringing a highly diverse group of thoughtful and intelligent people together and giving them opportunities to interact and to enter into meaningful dialogue is one of the key ways in which innovative new ideas can be generated and new possibilities for the future can be imagined. And we thank you once again for taking the time out from your very busy schedules and making the long journey to be with us here today to join us in thinking not only about the present, but about the future of global health, and in particular, about the kinds of key contributions that public health can make in enhancing this incredibly important field. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me now turn the podium over to my colleague, Professor Alistair Ager, um, the Executive Director of the Global Health Initiative at the Mailman School of Public Health and Professor of Clinical Population and Family Health at the Mailman School here at Columbia. Thank you. Could I have the presentation, please? Um, during the, uh, the planning meeting, the notion of a changing landscape was very helpful to us, and there were some initial uh, pictures that we shared of actually the landscape we're currently in. We're around uh, there at the moment. This is an aerial view of this landscape. Around just over 100 years ago, that was this landscape. And we were reflecting on the forces, the economic forces. Uh, it was, used to be a, a place to come on a Sunday afternoon bicycle ride. The vision, the intellectual forces, the imagination, the migration, the innovation, that shaped over 100 years this space in terms of culture, in terms of popular activity, in terms of this street, which is now a pedestrian area that we've just worked through, in terms of political ferment in this area during the 60s, in terms of this cafeteria, which some of you may know is popularized across the world in over 200 television stations from one Seinfeld uh, comedy as a mark of globalization. This is the landscape that we're in. There are multiple forces that have shaped it and transformed it. And we reflected then on the, the global health, the global public health landscape, and the fragmentary nature of how we would represent that. And we've been searching for a way, with yourselves, as a way to map 
That's something of the challenges we see. This was an early attempt. This is just the images we choose to use across the world in terms of various global health initiatives to mark the image of what we're seeking to do. But many of you will uh, be aware that in preparation for this meeting, we wanted to make sure that the agenda of this meeting was very much your agenda. And so we wanted to map that landscape in a more thorough way. And I want to explain a little bit about these dots which you have helped contribute. Um, every one of you that was confirmed in your attendance by the end of September was harried by our staff to suggest three key forces, three key issues that you felt were transforming and shaping the landscape. And 85 of you responded, and I thank you for that. And the 85 of you each suggested three key issues that from your perspective were driving the way that we saw the world. That gives us 255 suggestions of things that should be on our agenda. And we have this wonderful resource as many universities of graduate students who independently went through those 255 suggestions, grouping them in ways that they thought made sense, but completely independently of each other. And with multiple independent raters, we were able to then use multidimensional scaling software to create that picture of how things went together, but we don't know initially what those issues are. Let me tell you what those issues are. Let's start in the bottom right-hand corner. These issues there are around, a lot of discussion around changing disease patterns, involving the emergence of chronic disease and also emerging infections, but of the retention of significant burden of infectious disease of demographic shifts within populations due to transitions in fertility and in longevity, population movements, migrations of various forms, both internal and international, economic change that is being driven through that and affected by that, broader socio-economic transition within and between countries, political change and ferment, the change of a world order, the investments in health that can be made or are not being made, partly in reflection of that changing world order. The changing partnerships we see between North and South, between South and South, between public and private partnerships. Human resources and the key issues around capacity for health and health systems in the way that we might provide effective services. Capacity developed as a more general issue and linked to that issues around communication technology and its opportunities and also scientific advance. If I go further around, ecological crisis, climate change, restricted water resources and resource constraints. That was your agenda. And we looked with some trepidation at how your agenda then mapped into something from the planning committee we were set on our track towards. And we feel quite comfortable that in terms of the changing health and prevention needs that we'd anticipated, looking at demographic and epidemiological transitions, then the group and the papers we have commissioned are very, very much covering that area of work. In terms of the notion of globalization and global health governance, we feel reassured that there are issues here around globalization that you are indeed seeing affect the way we think about health and the interactions and the structures and the governance of that. In terms of health systems and the capacity to deliver effective health systems, a major strand, and here we have innovations in science and te technology. So around 85% of the issues are comfortably, I think, or we would suggest, mapped by those areas. There are many issues around here, particularly as you see around uh, environmental conditions and climate change, that we want to suggest two things about those. One, we want to suggest that we could consider these as a cross-cutting issue for deliberation within these groups and encourage us to think how those things relate to these issues. But as Richard said also, uh, tomorrow there is an opportunity in terms of the way we structure our final thinking, if there's a, a caucus or a group to say we really should give some focused attention to some of these issues, we can convene a group uh, to do that. So that creates a sense of reflection back to you of your agenda, your issues, and how we want to try to seek them to reflect them on the program. The final thing I wanted to share is that there was a contention from the planning meeting that we needed to bring together from diverse perspectives, and there were two ways of doing that. One was to acknowledge this notion of constituencies or the roles that we were currently playing. And so this is that framework. I just want, to add, just want to show you where those dots came from in terms of constituencies, because is, are different parts of this agenda reflecting different groupings out there 
Are, is the diversity in what we see as the issues, or do we see issues broadly similarly, but maybe we need to bring our distinctive perspectives to them? So this is what policymakers saw. This is what educators saw. This is what researchers saw. This is what practitioners saw. This was what activists saw. And finally, the private sector saw that. And I think you can see there's a mosaic there. You might see some subtle patterns, but our conclusion from that is that we are not differing hugely in terms of where we see the issues. We may have different perspectives on them, but we share something of these as key issues within the landscape. And similarly, in terms of our geography, we asked about where your focus of your work had been over the last 10 years in terms of region. And so those of you who have been focused in Africa saw these as the dominant issues. In Asia, these are the dominant issues. In the Caribbean, these are the issues. The Middle East, these issues. Latin America, these issues. North America, there. And again, a significant mosaic. So we take from that that we are not, when we're dividing people into groups, having particular sections of the agenda driven by one constituency, that we have remarkable similar view that this range of issues is key to us. And so the challenge for us on our program is to find ways of bringing together those different perspectives reflecting on what appears to be an emerging map of core issues for us to face. So I look forward to our discussions over the next day uh, from our different groupings, particularly around issues focused in this area. And it's with that I have great pleasure in inviting Linda back to the stage to suggest to us some key propositional questions related to each of these areas. Thank you. Well, hello again. I, as I said at the beginning, and you've now heard repeatedly, we think that we are on the perhaps a third of the way into a process. The process has been building through much discussion and reflection over the last two years. It was deeply accelerated by the planning meeting that uh, over 40 of you were at in March. And I think the, the direction was verified in the survey that you all participated in that Alistair just reflected on. What I'd like to do is to uh, report to you coming out of the planning meeting and work since then on the propositional questions that we would like to offer to all of you as the focus for our work over the next two days. Uh, I'll start out by saying that, um, excuse me, I didn't realize the slides were up. Um, I, you know, the timing of this meeting is, although it's building on two years of planning, may be both appropriate and even timely and fortuitous. We are meeting a year before the UN Summit on Noncommunicable Diseases and a month after the MDG Review Summit when, uh, as I'm sure everybody here knows, Kofi Annan wrote that while, quote, the true significance of our growing interdependence is becoming increasingly obvious, lack of concerted leadership is proving to be a formidable obstacle. The message must be that MDG achievement is not optional, but an essential investment in a fairer, safer, and more prosperous world. But achieving the MDGs is only the first step. For even if we succeed and meet all goals by 2013, millions will continue to die from preventable diseases or unnecessary complications. We will certainly need to take the MDGs to the next level after the initial deadline. The concerns that Kofi Annan raised, of course, are recognizable to everyone in this room, as well as the objectives. We've seen evidence of great progress, significant obstacles, and, as Alistair just laid out so elegantly, changing needs superimposed on significant, relentless, pre-existing concerns. Under current frames, the problems, I think, can sometimes seem quite overwhelming to all of us and insurmountable to many. Addressing the changes already happening on the horizon, even the intermediate and certainly the long-term horizon, might seem impossible when we haven't even solved the problem of the killers in front of us. On the other hand, there are knowledge breakthroughs within sight 
and novel approaches that could potentially provide ways forward on many fronts simultaneously, insights in emerging problems that might help us in innovative ways solve the pre-existing ones. So I'll start in laying out the propositional questions back where Peter set us up, uh, and just uh, with two definitions of global health that we looked at during the planning meeting. Uh, the first, uh, the statement by Brown, Cueto, and Fee that global health implies consideration of the health needs of the people of the whole planet above the concerns of particular nations and is associated with the growing importance of actors beyond governmental and intergovernmental organizations and agencies. And the definition offered by Beagle Hall and Bonita in 2008 regarding global public health as the collective action we take worldwide for improving health and health equity, aiming to bring the best available, cost-effective and feasible interventions to all populations and selected high-risk groups. Essential collective actions for health improvement include disease prevention, health promotion, health protection, and provision of health care. Now, there are many definitions, as Peter said, that we could consider, and I'm not uh, saying that these are sacrosanct, but perhaps they'll get us going for today. And uh, I think with a joint recognition that global health, global public health, has unique and critically important roles in creating global health and well-being. And ahead of us are the questions about how to really accomplish what the future requires. As I look across the room, I think that there are several unifying principles that, to my perception at least, undergird our joint perspectives, goals, and work. First, a commitment. A commitment to optimizing the health of populations through population-based approaches for the public good, designed on a platform, a platform of knowledge, evidence, and experience, and focused on human needs and goals, and accomplishing the greatest good for all. This rests on a foundation that health for all is a human right, and that health of the most vulnerable is key to the well-being of society. And it focuses on a necessity ahead of us of taking what my colleague Jack Rowe calls a bifocal perspective, aligning the short term with the long-term directions we're heading in. As we learn from accomplishments to date, recognize and solve the obstacles that confront us and ensure that we are supporting the, direct, the directions that will optimize our long-term future, particularly confronted by the problems on our plate, which are complex and where long-term solutions will have much greater benefit for all than after the fact interventions. So we're here because there, I think there is mounting recognition, as you've already heard this morning, of a need for reframed vision and leadership to accomplish health for the world's populations in the face of recognition of the need for new strategies for long-standing problems and new health challenges superimposed on these that will both require new strategies and new commitment. Perhaps with the breadth of issues in mind that comprise global health, we may utilize new evidence and capabilities to discover new solutions and implement them in more effective ways that help us solve long-standing issues. I think it's our contention that public health has a responsibility to assess how, and not whether, we can provide in ever more impactful ways the ways forward to achieving global health. The keys, of course, are our tools in public health, population science, a foundation of social justice and commitment to the public good, appreciation of how the world's needs are changing, and the frames of setting goals for improving the health of millions and billions, the world's population, through multidisciplinary, collaborative, and sustainable interventions. So today, we will be thinking about where are the needs, the obstacles, and the opportunities for inter innovative solutions with a bifocal approach. And this meeting is designed 
to lay out the questions that we've arrived at to this point and for us to work on these together. To move our field into a stronger ability to lead in accomplishing global health for all populations, the planners at the March meeting and the organizing committee propose that we frame our work today and tomorrow and potentially in an ongoing way together after that around some big questions. And I have to thank Peter Piot and Julio Franck, who worked with Richard and myself to try and really um, express the propositional questions that came out of our planning meeting. And I hope that the rest of you who were there agreed that we did this with fidelity. The overall question that we arrived at that we need to confront is how does the changing landscape of global public health require new perspectives, new thinking, and new forms of action? The planning meeting suggested that the way forward toward answering this overall question is to first figure out together the innovative answers to four propositional questions and then use these answers in an integrated way as a basis for creating a real frame shift of understanding and a basis for visionary action going forward. So the first of the four propositional questions that we hope will add up to our collective vision for this one is this. How are health and it prevention needs changing globally? And considering whether understanding this leads us to a frame shift in how to approach improving global health for the future. Key issues, of course, are the long-standing health challenges, which are achieving some breakthroughs, but where, for many, new levels of solutions are needed. The issues of safe and healthy food and water, of preventing death and childbirth for women around the world, and ensuring the health of women and children, reproductive health, and preventing violence against women, and prevention and treatment of malaria, HIV, AIDS, and controlling resistant TB. These highly interrelated issues, are, of course, are key to the well-being of all of us, are essential to accomplish, and particularly threaten the most vulnerable. At the same time, we all know that the world's changing with new challenges to all of our health and well-being. And on both near and farther horizons, from the huge surge in preventable chronic conditions to the impacts of climate change, the aging of the population, and health of cities. And these challenges are not uh, mutually exclusive, but layered on top of the ones we've been tackling for decades, which persist and must be solved. So what challenges and opportunities do these trends present to public health leadership? And how can understanding the changes ahead of us in the context of current needs frame a transformational process and goals by which global public health will lead towards global health in 2030 to 2050. That vision, we think, will help us lay the basis starting today. So we have a background paper on how global health is changing. You just heard some of your own perspectives, which ma match it exactly, from Alastair. I'll show you very briefly a little bit of the data um, just to get our juices flowing. Um, some of it are demographic changes. I'm picking on just a few uh, examples, but certainly the success of public health and medicine in the last century is that the percent that is that our populations are aging because we're living longer. What does that mean for global public health and global health? Here you see an example of how the percent of people 65 or older are increasing by region and in fact uh, even in the regions where that is not obvious the absolute numbers are of older people are increasing dramatically. Uh, you can see that if you watch this world's population pyramid change from 1960 in front of your eyes to 2030 and 2050 as the population of the world rectangularizes. And deaths, even the easiest thing to measure, um, is changing, the causes of death. Now here you see a, a graph provided by Sandra Galea, uh, as well as the other data I'm showing you, from 19, the distribution of causes of mortality here in, for the Americas 
from 1960 in the bottom bar to 2050, 2030, excuse me, projections to the top. And the different colors signify different causes of death, going from left to right, infectious diseases, HIV AIDS in green, respiratory infections, cancers in blue in the middle, uh, excuse me, in purple on the left, cardiovascular disease in blue in the middle, injuries in gold, and other non-communicable diseases in a kind of solid purple line on the right. I'm orienting to you because I want to point out, first of all, that the patterns are reasonably stable in the Americas over time since 1960, and similarly reasonably stable um, in Europe, but dramatically shifting, of course, all across the world. Uh, Western Pacific, Eastern Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, Africa dramatically shifting patterns of disease and, of course, with an increasing prominence of chronic non-communicable diseases as the cause of death worldwide. Uh, other issues, of course, you can look at specific diseases. Here you see a map of the um, projected relative mortality rate ratios for cardiovascular disease by WHO regions in 2030, and the darkness of the blue signifies the highest rates. Uh, and you can see that a significant proportion of the world is experiencing significant mortality from cardiovascular disease, and this is worldwide. Um, similarly, for injuries, uh, rates vary across the world with the greatest rates of injuries in Africa and Southeast Asia, but also across uh, Europe, Russia, and even China. We heard from Judith Roden about tobacco use. I'm going, I'm going to skip over that and focus on the export of a non of non-communicable diseases through um, thing, things signified perhaps by the diet we eat at McDonald's. McDonald's 2010. Uh, you can see its distribution worldwide. What does that tell us as a marker of patterns of export of the diets that are increasingly underlying? obesity. And finally, again, as just uh, an example of the changes in the world, in 2000 we were moving toward two-thirds of the world living in cities, and here you see the, uh, the areas in dark blue where more than 50 percent of the population is living in urban areas in 2000. So we have many major macro public health trends that we expect to accelerate over the coming decades to the middle of the century. Environmental changes, which I haven't really touched on, emerging infectious diseases, wor worsening disparities, chronic diseases, and the public health challenges of living longer as well as the opportunities. And we have, in a way, an evolving public health pyramid. Maybe we shouldn't call it a pyramid anymore. Um, but still using the same design we've lived with, um, so many dimensions to what constitutes the health of populations. And we recognize that in a world of people's health driven heavily by environment, physical environment and built environment, and humanly driven contextual factors, health system designs and multi-level solutions, structural solutions have to be part of the solution. So-called non-communicable diseases, of course, are spreading like wildfire globally, fueled by uh, something that's not non-communicable, uh, the contagion of risk factors like smoking and processed food and decreased physical activity. And the ch some of the challenge, of course, is that multiplicity of health problems are increase and threats are increasingly the norm propelling the recognition among all of us that we need new non-siloed solutions in terms of health systems and structural approaches. There are also, of course, major shifts to global interdependencies that are affecting health, and increasing evidence and recognition that the historic classifications of Global South and Global North may mask significant heterogeneity in health concerns, as well as areas where health needs are converging and not diverging. So under this first propositional question, we need to think about how these facts influence our overarching approach 
to tackling global health challenges. How do we systematically and most effectively understand the answers to these questions? Do we need new frames? This background leads us to our second propositional question, which is how can innovations in, in science and technology shape the, and change the way we see, think, and act? Can new technologies for water handling offer solutions for impending water scarcity if they're built into our planning in both urban and rural areas? Can system science offer cognitive strategies for handling complexity and finding the most effective levers to improving health? And from this perspective, what are the key foci for scientific research for the future that will help us really appreciate the complexity of factors shifting our health patterns. Our third and fourth propositional questions, in summary, are how do changing needs indicate needs for changing health systems and global governance? Given that the majority of health needs are caused or affected by factors outside the healthcare system, what are the opportunities and responsibilities for public health to create a system to protect health that's inclusive of many domains uh, that have to be actors in health protection. How can health systems and global governance be designed to take responsibility for health needs of populations, to see health equity as both a responsibility and an attainable goal, and tackle the integrated health needs of populations not fractured by disease or interest groups? In particular, how do we create a unifying perspective on population health needs that does not assume a zero-sum game, where an investment in one problem requires a divesting in some other area. Can we find new, more innovative, and effective ways to work on interdependent and coexisting problems? How do we design and foster a new type of global governance and new types of health systems that can better protect the health and well-being of all global citizens? which actors, agencies, and constituencies need a more effective voice in shaping public health strategies globally? What are the education and training innovations needed to support effective health systems? As I look around at who's in the room, all of you are needed to shape the answers to these questions. So overall, if over the next 32 hours we can tackle these four questions with highly innovative and collaborative thinking, I think we have a chance to bring the answers to each question together into a greater whole to answer our overall question. How the changing landscape of global public health requires new perspectives, new thinking, and new forms of action, and how public health must lead to contribute to our global health needs of the coming decades. Now, how on earth to do this? How are we going to engineer this vision together? Well, there, I'm going to conclude by suggesting the tools of innovative thinking uh, that we might be able to employ together. How do we get our minds in the most innovative frames to engineer change? Well, one set of evidence indi indicates, I think, what we all know, that formulating problems and solving problems are inherently interdependent activities, and that defining the problem includes questioning of how the problem is framed, and whether it can be restated to allow a wider range of solutions. So I'd like to conclude by suggesting um, for our collaborative experiment today and tomorrow, uh, thinking on issues that we all agree are of great import, some tools for innovation generation. And they come from my colleague Roberta Ness, dean at the University of Texas School of Public Health, who couldn't be here today, but sent these slides instead. She wanted to remind us that we're, when you're in the business of collaborative innovation generation in only 32 hour period, you need to start by using tools that involve thinking outside the frame because frames define human communication and thus thinking and express the expectations we walk in with but we might want, not want to keep. This requires accurate ac observation. Do you know how to draw your cell phone? If you close your eyes, it requires um, 
thinking beyond what we've been told, like the example of the Nobel Prize that was um, given to Marshall and Warren for the discovery of H. pylori as the cause of ulcers. Innovation requires making sure that the framing of the past doesn't frame the future if it's no longer going to serve us, and that we're not interpreting new information with old contexts. It also requires asking ourselves and challenging each other as to the right metaphors that we're using. Should we be talking about a war on cancer or should we be shifting our frames to think about life course approaches to prevention? Should we be focusing on absence as well as presence? It's easier for us to think about the presence of disease. The absence of disease sounds like a negative and yet it's a goal. And we need to think about conceptual biases. Is it my disease or your disease we're going to solve today? Do we have to have that zero-sum game? Will that serve people? Do we have to assume that a the aging of a population and old people being around is going to harm our children? Could we find other ways out that could be good for everybody? Um, and we can challenge each other by posing the opposites, um, like cups are made of ice or fat people get paid more, just to break our assumptions about what the truth is. And brainstorming. A good brainstorm generates 100 ideas per hour. That's one of the things we want to engage in today. It works. Um, studies have shown that you, if you use these tools, you get two to three times the increases in, in, in originality and significant improvements in problem solving, as well as attitude and work performance. So I'll conclude by saying uh, with thanks to everybody who worked so hard to put these propositional questions together, that the substance of the questions were designed and the process today and tomorrow is designed to foster our ability to work together as a basis for acting differently, which will require seeing differently perhaps with a bifocal vision to understanding what's in the future and making sure that the present is aligned with where we need to go and today thinking differently. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to move into the next um uh, phase of, of this morning's work with a series of presentations of the background papers. Um, I'm going to uh, be very brief in making introductions as, as you should have already discovered by now in, in the book that has been prepared for the meeting there are longer biographies of all of the speakers so I'm going to ask the forgiveness uh, of each speaker in the interest of time and, and simply do uh, a brief uh, introduction rather than the longer one which you can find in, in the book. Um, I also should mention uh, and thank the Kaiser Family Foundation um, which has generously uh, offered to film uh, the, these sessions so that they can be webcast in the future. Um, and uh, we're, we're very much appreciative for, for Kaiser's uh, support on this. The first of the, of the presentations on changing health and prevention needs, uh, the background paper was prepared by Dr. Carlos Caceres and Dr. Walter Mendoza, um, and Carlos will present the paper followed by discussant responses um, from Dr. Alex Eza and Dr. Sanya Nishtar. Yes, I believe that will do your slides. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to thank the, the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's a honor for me to be here this morning, and I would like to acknowledge my, my colleague, my co-author, Dr. Walter Mendoza from UNFPA Peru. Um, so, in essence, uh, well, uh, you got our uh, papers in the booklet, so essentially we were supposed to highlight the key issues in this presentation. Uh, this is an emerging field, patterns of health and disease 
under determinants in an international context framed by globalization, where global and economic flows and political processes are essential elements. Uh, so the goal uh, for me here is to outline, to outline some of the key dimensions of change in demographic and epidemiologic patterns and, the, and the drivers, and also assess whether our scientific paradigm really allows us to ask and to respond to the key questions in a framework conscious about equity, broader development, and human rights. So uh, assessments based on national and regional figures in an, in an unequal societies, essentially unequal societies, are insufficient. So we really need to measure the magnitude of change over time, direction and characteristics of change, trends and the determinants, also differences within and between countries, factors potentially related to those changes. Now, uh, when I look at summary uh, tables it's really and, and figures, it, it really doesn't provide the right information and we can't do as much as we should do. So here we would like to point out a few key indicators just to start a discussion that should continue more comprehensively. Um, well, two key issues discussing uh, health and prevention needs were portrayed uh, uh, actually in, in uh, foreign policy in October and November, um, urbanization and aging. So we see that uh, many other actors are recognizing these topics as, as really much uh, beyond the, the field of, of, of health, of, of global health. Um, I think Linda also showed us a bit of this already. Um, age, uh, life expectancy at age 60 in major regions of the, uh, of the world. Uh, the increases uh, in all regions, some regions start, are starting from a higher level, uh, but obviously it, it hap it's happening everywhere. And um, if we look at mortality, no, I have I, I think 12 of these graphs, and uh, they are all different. So one key message is that mortality curves are different uh, across the world. Uh, so you see, uh, this, the previous one was more developed regions, Sub-Saharan Africa. You see that the younger ages are the blue, and the older ages are the, the, the orange. But we see that in essence, uh, we are getting the same kind of trend across Northern Africa, Asia, uh, China and India specifically, Europe, the Caribbean, uh, Central America, South America, and North America and Oceania. In essence, uh, what we see is uh, it's a diverse global mortality picture and child mortality will, will fall everywhere, but will remain high for at least two more decades in Sub-Saharan Africa and in India. However, there is a general trend. Uh, there's an opportunity for what demographers call the demographic dividend. No? Uh, so an increase in the uh, economically active population, but if, if it's going to work, it, it implies active public policy, education, investment then we also need to plan to respond to changing morbidity and mortality and reach what they also call morbidity compression, which is essentially not only uh, having people live longer, but getting ill later in their lives. So having more years of uh, good quality life. This is uh, about morbidity. Diabetes uh, as an emerging disease resulting from changing, changing like habits. For example, here, uh, migration, new patterns of living, food intake, uh, rising cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and cancer are part of what we're seeing. This is in, uh, explained in part by economic and cultural globalization and trend liberalization. Uh, diabetes actually is uh, uh, in, in adults is going to increase from 6.4 percent uh, in 2010 to 7.7 .7 in 2030, and the increase is going to be 69 percent in developing countries as opposed to only 20 percent in developed countries. Um, gender and sexuality, well, 
uh, as much as mortality is, in, is uh, uh, decreasing, fertility is, and maternal mortality are also decreasing. So this is fertility rate trends. Uh, there, uh, this implies changing health needs of women uh, who will perhaps require relatively less MCH and sexual and reproductive health care and more uh, care for age-related concerns. Also emerging male needs, including sexual health, prostate cancer, uh, uh, erectile dysfunction, and other uh, mental health, for example. Uh, there are also uh, increasingly recognized changes in the social organization of sexuality. Uh, for the first time in, in history, we're taking seriously issues around changes in uh, patterns of uh, sexual partnering, recognizing uh, sexual minorities, gender diversity, new families, new patterns of adoption, pat uh, changes in nuptiality. So this all should be reflected in our demo demographic data because it has to be a matter of public policy as well. And we uh, should uh, stop assuming that we're planning for heterosexual populations. We need to recognize that diversity, it's a matter of rights. Uh, then um, this is migration and new dimensions of change. He, uh, clearly we are, in, in 2020, uh, in developing countries, the sizes of uh, urban uh, population uh, will actually uh, outgrow the sizes of rural populations. It has happened in, in uh, developed countries a long time ago already. So uh, this implies changing uh, this many changes in, in what services should offer. Then there are continuing flows from south to north, usually worse of, the worse off are those who who undertake, uh, who, who travel, and they will be willing to undertake low quality jobs. Uh, but also many health professionals in, in, the, in the South who migrate. By 2050, 74% of, of the global urban population, in fact, will live in Africa and Asia, um, quite differently from what we see now. Then changes, uh, New dimensions of change uh, are about new movements around health and also in the increasing role of communication technology, which creates new virtual communities. People talk to each other and relate to each other in ways they had never done that they, they had never done before. And that implies new ways of thinking, new subjectivities, new new communities. This is about social drivers of health and disease. Uh, well, this is the other part that we usually don't talk enough about, and we need to start talking about this if, you're, if we're seriously talking about changing health and prevention needs. Um, and also they are drivers of health and disease, not just of disease. Drivers are multicausal and diverse. Uh, burden, the burden of disease is highly variable. Uh, a major, if not the most important driver of health disparities is different in access to essential goods and general living con conditions, educations, education rights. So uh, in line of the conclusions of the WHO Committee of, uh, on Special Determinants on Health, avoidable health inequities arise because of the conditions in which people live, work and age, and the systems put in place uh, to deal with illness, in turn shaped by political, social, and economic forces. Unfortunately, this was an extremely valuable report, and we, have done, we haven't done really enough about this so far. Uh, so we see this picture uh, showing the household, households lacking basic services by size of urban area and geographic region. And we see that for sub-Saharan Africa, the columns are very, very, very high. In, in, uh, for all sizes of, of uh, living. Well, this is Haiti, October 2010, to remind us that in spite of, of how we talk about technology and progress, we can still uh, be back 100, uh, 100 or 200 years ago. So we, um, and, and this is about access, this is about inequity. Well, the, these are a few uh, graphs showing just uh, 
human development, the Human Development Index, uh, which is, as you know, related to income, to uh, education and to life expectancy. Here uh, we see it, uh, income related to, uh, on, the, on the left to the Human Development Index and on the right to life expectancy. In general, we see these trends. Perhaps uh, the problem is that uh, looking at these uh, as global regions, we don't see enough information or information that is useful enough. So probably uh, we, we have to keep uh, looking at, into more specific uh, detailed uh, descriptions. Mm. Okay. This is actually education and income trends, the same thing. Uh, in all regions, we are uh, seeing a, a positive relationship between income and, in this case, education. Uh, this is actually uh, the Millennium Develop Development Goals and, and Progress. We see population living on less than $124, $25 a day. And unfortunately, in many regions, in red, uh, uh, there are setbacks. The greens are progress. Uh, also, uh, a, a difficult situation with regard to children under five who are underweight. <clears throat> so, for example, here this is uh, mortality uh, in uh, and, and, and uh, in, in children under five, and we also see that we are going backwards in, in many places. Um, and also immunization against measles uh, to, to the right side. In this case, we are seeing more green, we are seeing more progress. But still, um, if we look at specific countries in the world, we can see that uh, progress is not uniform and we still have a long way to go. This is actually very important for maternal mortality, which is uh, one of the most difficult millenn millennium development uh, related uh, issues and goals. And here we see that there is some progress in many places with regard to birds uh, attended by skilled health personnel. Um, this is HIV. On, on the right, the proportion of, of, of uh, progress, I mean, countries uh, showing progress in, in HIV infection reduction. And unfortunately, we, we see that that there's no uh, green or yellow everywhere. We are still seeing uh, setbacks. And to the, to the right, we see population in need for ARVs. Uh, so we see that in, in many places, coverage is still quite limited. So in spite of all the progress we've made with regard to HIV, we still have to go. Finally, um, these two last slides, uh, the second part, and this is kind of a provocative part, and, and I hope we, we will continue to discuss this in, in the groups. Um, we have to reassess our analytic frameworks and, the, and what we call evidence. We have to go back to the basics. What do we define as cause? What is change? What is an outcome of interest? By, by and for whom are questions asked? Uh, epidemiological research can only demonstrate, in, as we all uh, epidemiologists here know, the associations it ascertains. So we, it depends of, of, on our hypothesis, on, on, on what hypothesis we test. Um, there, in, in, in many cases, when, cases when we're looking at, at uh, problems for which we, we have very proximal, even uh, molecular bi biology level determinants, but also stru large structural level uh, causal factors. There are problems in commensurability, uh, and we can't use single models to study everything. So, um, uh, two, two different levels of specificity. So, in many cases, ep epidemiology, unfortunately, tends to focus on proximal issues, which uh, does not solve the problem and leaves social determinants aside. So we really need, in many cases, to, to, to study at different levels and to involve uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, to study different levels of specificity. There is a rich tradition in the world of social epidemiology. Uh, there, it's a very rich field with uh, bright minds. Uh, but it hasn't really been mainstreamed, and, and we really need to uh, get some of those lessons, some of that thinking back into mainstream epidemiology. Finally, um, is epidemiology really or sufficiently focused on health, 
no? uh, in its positive aspects, such as well-being, quality of life, happiness. Um, also the issue about standards to study causality and evaluate efficacy of public health interventions. We still have the hegemony of the experimental paradigm and randomized controlled trials. They limit, uh, because of cost, because of many other things, in, in uh, observation to short-term uh, periods. So assessing the effects of more distal social level uh, interventions is very difficult, and they remain, in many cases, unaddressed. So more fundament, uh, the, the more fundamental question about so science as social practice is also necessary to, to ask. Um, knowledge uh, generated does not necessarily reflect the best thinking. Unfortunately, in many cases, it reflects the thinking that got the conditions to be, to be produced because of institutional and funding uh, and, uh, issues. So perhaps just to end this last statement, critical, a critical global public health must strive for more democratic participation of scientific communities in debates about causality and needs within the human rights framework. Thank you very much. Carlos, and I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Alex Eza uh, from the Africa Population and Health Research Center in Kenya uh, to be our first discussant. Uh, thank you, Richard. It's really a great pleasure to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to comment on uh, Caceres and Mendoza's paper. As you listened to it this morning, I believe that the authors did an excellent job of summarizing the current demographic and uh, epidemiological processes that drive changing global public health. Uh, an area that didn't seem to receive much attention in the paper is the issue of prevention needs. And I will focus my few minutes uh, looking at why this is important. This is not a critique of the paper. I think it's a reflection of the current discourse we have in the field of global public health, where a lot of what we discuss really focus on the burden of disease, often as a, uh, as, uh, a measure of health. Indeed, most framing of health is around disease and disability, and I think we may need to find ways to move beyond that. If you get into prevention and think about the pre prevention needs in global public health, I believe that prevention is really what what this differentiates uh, public health from clinical medicine. Currently, about 80% of HIV AIDS expenditure is on treatment, especially the rollout of antiretrovirals. Ignoring the economics and politics of global health, uh, global health funding for a moment, we should ask the question, why are prevention needs important in global public health? There might be many reasons we could give, but I will focus on three, uh, at least the ones that stand out to me. First is the fact that treatment is several times more expensive and hopelessly unaffordable to many people, whether you are thinking about uh, high-income countries or medium-income countries or low-income settings. You can look at this in so many different ways. One is the issue of limited human resource capacity and consequently low effective coverage of health interventions and treatment uh, paradigms. If you take a place of, uh, uh, for some countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we understand that the region bears maybe 25% of global disease burden, but has 3% of the health workforce, it doesn't matter how you stretch it, you cannot achieve effective treatment coverage for any of the diseases. So the issues of prevention becomes very critical and important. We also do know that treatment is, can be uh, uh, very costly. And more importantly, uh, the indirect cause of illness, uh, whether you look at issues of uh, uh, whether you look at issues of lost productivity or reduced social participation and other aspects of illness. The second area, why uh, reason why uh, prevention uh, needs is important for global public health is really around the issue of changing disease patterns and demographic shifts, which make. Uh, which make prevention models very imperative when we think about health uh, and well-being. The first is the issue of changing lifestyles, and I think we have seen a lot or heard a lot in the course of this morning around that and the 
fact that for non-communicable diseases, this is becoming uh, a major challenge. Um, we, in, at the African Population and Health Research Center, we run this uh, longitudinal surveillance system in the slums of Nairobi. And from there, we do, do collect data on cause of death. And from there, you can look at some of the key determined drivers of health within an urban informal setting. And when you look at things like HIV AIDS accounting for 50% of the years of life lost, and issues relating to violence and, um, and, and accidents counting for almost 20%, you realize that treatment strategies often would not be able to address the number of these things, and prevention becomes a key uh, strategy, uh, 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 a key aspect of understanding and addressing global health uh, uh, challenges. We can also look at the issue um, of a uh, third point is the fact that prevention programs, I believe, reduce inequity inequities in health outcomes. Most inequities actually are exacerbated by the fact that uh, different people have differential access to treatment. If you look at um, some of the access issues with respect to um, a number of uh, items here between the slums in red and Nairobi as a whole, you realize that a lot of the people, even within an urban setting where we believe access is much more uh, um, uh, uh, widespread. You have huge differentials in access. So if we are able to address a lot of the prevention needs, we could re reduce a lot of these uh, uh, disparities in, in, in health outcomes and health status. Indeed, despite the general acceptance of the need to address the social determinants of health, most discourse and investments on prevention programs are technology driven with vaccine, uh, with vaccine development accounting for the largest part. As important as these initiatives are, we know that if we find a vaccine for malaria or HIV today, many Africans will still die from these diseases. Just as hundreds of thousands of children still die each year from diarrhea and women from childbirth, despite the availability of low-cost and effective technology solutions for these conditions. As we struggle to identify current, more efficient and cost-effective ways to translate what is known and proven to work to benefit more people globally, I believe we must not forget the issue of disease prevention. The field of, uh, uh, the, the field of global health needs leaders to advance new prevention theories and models and the practice in, in the practice of global public health. And I really believe this is an area we need to give attention as we discuss over the next uh, uh, two days on changing global uh, public uh, landscape. Uh, the issue of prevention is something that we may need to think more about. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And now I'd like to ask Sanya Nishta to uh, join us as the second discussant. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me this opportunity to thank the organizers for asking me to speak. It's a privilege indeed. Uh, this paper by Carlos and Mendoza alludes to two aspects of changing health and prevention needs. One is centered on the empirics of causality, whilst the other focuses on the strategies for action. And I'd like to focus my attention on, and the comments that I make, on the latter. Now, whilst I do that, I'd like to touch upon what I'd like to refer to as the triple imperative of the changing landscape of global public health. The first aspect relates to a transition that appears to be currently underway from a focus exclusively on diseases towards systems. The second relates to uh, a burgeoning understanding of the role of health in all policies and the third relates to the possible emergence of a new public health order that takes cognizance of the increasing burden of non-communicable diseases. With reference to the transition from diseases towards systems, it is always useful to look back into history and to see how changes in the global political economy 
have shaped norms and institutional arrangements and standards uh, within the health sector. And if you look back into time, and in the last three decades in particular, you will appreciate that they have been a concerted effort on time-bound, outcome-based, disease-specific targets. And this movement has accentuated appreciably in the wake of the AIDS movement back in the 80s. And subsequently, it was intensified uh, it, with the pronouncement of the Millennium De uh, Declaration and the stipulation of the Millennium Development Goals. We have seen in the last two decades a burgeoning of global health initiatives and a focus on public-private partnerships and a bringing together of agencies that have the mandate to deliver public good and, the, on the other hand, agencies that can facilitate this goal. Um, and, in, and in addition, particularly over the last decade and a half, uh, 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 an unprecedented increase in health official development assistance and engagement of new actors, particularly private foundations, in financing of health in the developing countries. But after all this attention to disease-focused targets, there is now a realization that without attention to the systemic constraints that stand in the way of achieving these disease-specific targets, quantum leaps in improvements in the health of populations in the poor countries will not be possible. There therefore now appears to be a movement underway, and this movement is characterized by transformational changes in many agencies around the world. We see, for instance, and as was alluded to early in the morning, that major global health initiatives such as Gavi and the Global Fund have now new health, health system strengthening windows and conditionalities stipulated. The new global health initiatives which have emerged in the last 10 years have explicitly focused on health metrics and workforce in the domains of uh, health systems. The aid effectiveness movement and the stipulation of the Paris principles and the ACRA agenda and the norms coined by initiatives such as the International Health Partnership explicitly focus on country plans, system strengthening, country leadership, and enhancing the stewardship capacity within the health sector, within the countries themselves. WHO has resurrected the approach to primary health care in its report of 2008, and next month it, we will again hopefully see that in the World Health Report, which is focused on health financing this year. I'm sure many of you are aware that there have been many high-level declarations and statements in support of health systems, and one of them, the Bamako Declaration, has cascaded into, um, in, into the planning of a meeting in Montreux next month, which we hope will be a watershed in framing and bringing clarity to health systems empirics. Moreover, the focus on MNCH as part of the G8 agenda and as part of the agenda setting bilateral agencies is also evidence of the imp implicit importance that health systems are getting in shaping norms um, as we move uh, ahead in the years. But a critical question em emerges within this scenario. With the current focus on health systems in the traditional domains, is it possible for us to achieve the systemic constraints that stand in the way of achieving health outcomes in the poor developing countries? And this brings me to the second point that I want to make about the role of health in all policies. I'm sure you're all aware that health outcomes are not only influenced by the inputs and the outputs of a traditional healthcare and public health system, but that they are also influenced by a number of social determinants, uh, by several, by the interplay of several sectors within the intersectoral scope of health, by health-seeking behaviors at an individual level, and that the effectiveness of overall governance in the developing countries has a major role to play in all of these areas. If the poor developing countries will not have the capacity to generate growth, and accrue benefits of that growth equitably to populations if they will not have the capacity to mobilize indigenous resources sustainably, if they will not be committed to, um, to 
uh, debt limitation and fiscal responsibility and inculcating responsibility in public finance management and limiting the current leakages and pilferages from the system that are quite pervasive and bring efficiency and effectiveness in civil service management and, technical and enhance technical capacity within their ranks, significant strides, unfortunately, will not be possible. And I think this point has been made very eloquently recently by the Adelaide Statement on Health in All Policies, which draws attention not only the, to the broader systems of governance in terms of their impact on the health sector, but also to a range of other sectors within the domain of the international arena and domestic public policy, which have a huge role to play in shaping health systems norms and in impacting the outcomes that ultimately translate in achieving better health outcomes at an individual and community level. The third point that I'd like to uh, focus our attentions on relates to the possible emergence of a new public health order. I'm sure you'll all agree with me that non-communicable diseases and mental health and injuries have long been termed as the neglected epidemic. 80% of all the estimated deaths, I beg your pardon, 60% of all the estimated deaths and 80% of them in the developing countries can be attributable to non-communicable diseases. They have massive economic costs which have been recognized recently by the World Economic Forum in the, in the Global Risk Report and since the 1960s, we have seen repeated calls to action to step up uh, efforts to mainstream these diseases during the course of normal public health planning. And these calls have accentuated over the last past five years appreciably. But we see a huge paradox, because as opposed to these diseases, which inherently warrant a multi-stakeholder response with partnerships as its key feature, we see that when you browse through the list of 90 odd global health initiatives that are out there, not even a single of them is dedicated to non-communicable diseases. And there's a huge paradox evidenced in this, um, in this pattern. So how are we positioned as we move towards the 20 to, uh, 2011 September uh, meeting of the UN General Assembly? Now, as opposed to the lack of a glo concerted global response to non-communicable diseases, it is a bit heartening to notice that there has been a burgeoning of several initiatives over the last several years focused on non-communicable diseases, prevention and control. There have been high-level commitments by the heads of CARICOM and the Commonwealth. There have been declarations at, declarations at important fora such as the UN this May and at the ECOSOC meetings earlier this year. A number of normative frameworks have cascaded into implementation over the last 10 years. There are funding instruments of bilateral and multilateral development agencies. Uh, there's, there is now an explicit funding agency to support research work related to non-communicable diseases. There is the pioneering work of in the international NGOs, APEX professional associations, and private sector APEX entities. And of course, there is a growing realization within a certain constituency that the long-term chronic care systems that have been established in many countries of Africa as a result of the AIDS movement could actually be a stepping stone to institutionalize a preventive uh, and secondary prevention related care within the realm of non-communicable diseases prevention and control should a global response and movement get underway during the next one year. We, of course, have some coordinating platforms or the initial frameworks uh, thereof within the broader rubric of the World Health Organization in the form of NCDNet and the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council. But, of course, that concerted global response, which many other public health issues, comparable public health issues have received, is certainly lacking. So I would like to end by framing two questions. The first, of course, is within the rubric of non-communicable diseases. We know that we are currently at a time where, where fiscal constraints are grinding. We're all aware of the fact that the appetite is very limited for a new global initiative and that funding constraints would be a major impediment. But within the context of that reality, would it be possible 
to make a case for a supra-organizational structure that is charged with an implicit coordinating arrangement and which is mandated with the task of exploiting synergies, pooling technical resources, and coordinating policy. Would it be possible, given the heavy interplay of the role of the private sector in preventing these diseases, would it be possible to use the supra-organization structure as a platform to interface global multilateral institutions with APEX private sector entities? And would it be possible that such a structure could bridge the existing divide in conventional multilateralism and actually be a step towards creating a new framework for global governance in health? I'll leave you with that first question. And secondly, this reflects a little bit with the earlier comments I made. Uh, do institutions with the global mandate have the capacity and the voice and the leverage and the independence and the funding? We're, we're here at, at an academic institution which does stellar work and there are many others that do likewise. But then out there, there are global health institutions mandated with the task of formulating policy and cascading norms and standards, and ha which have the physical presence in 190 uh, countries. And we are well aware that such multilateral global institutions with a global health mandate have severe and grinding fiscal constraints, many uh, conditionalities stipulated. They do not have the fora for engaging a wide range of actors. They do not have the mandate to engage in the intersectoral scope of work. Uh, and would it be possible to overcome those constraints uh, and revamp and reconstitute those systems of global health governance is the second question that I'd like to leave you with. Um, uh, Dean Fried talked about re-engineering for change, and I hope that these two questions will be a small contribution in lending impetus to a dialogue around that during the course of these deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we're going to ask you to hold questions and comments to move through the presentations as quickly as we can. We'll have one more presentation and discussions before taking a break, then the break. The, the last two papers will be presented, and then we'll really have a long, uh, longer time for open discussion. So I'd like to move on now um, to the next presentation on innovations in science and technology. Uh, Peter Piat will present the background paper, and Hassan Mashinda and Katerina Ferreccio uh, will be our discussants. Peter, thank you. Thank you, uh, Richard, and uh, again, good morning. Uh, first, I should disclose that I'm absolutely not a techie. I, uh, when uh, Richard asked me to talk about technology and innovation, I kind of uh, resisted, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's on the other hand, I'm convinced that um, one of the main features of our time is the explosive development of innovative scientific, technological, business products and processes. And, and uh, for this paper, let's, that's what I call innovation and, and technology. And uh, where is the... Okay. First, uh, in the paper that uh, I hope you um, have looked at, I try to see, to take a look into the future also, what's in the pipeline. And uh, it is obviously in, impossible to predict the future, but um, a lot of innovation and, and technology products are already either on the market or first to become on the market. And um, with the explosion also of certain uh, scientific disciplines, we can expect and anticipate a lot of products that are going to come on the market. The most significant um, development probably when it comes to population health and social change uh, has to do with communication and information technologies, um, which are far more than just an instrument for communication. They've been a driver of social change in many, many aspects. Um, for rapid communication to sexual behavior and anything in between, marketing and so on. Uh, biotechnology is uh, giving us new vaccines, for example, new products, diagnostics, what have you. Miniaturization and nanotechnology, but particularly miniaturization, can really uh, become drivers for 
uh, dramatic changes, uh, particularly in medical practice. Um, think of uh, uh, very small, um, for example, ultrasound instruments and so on, which would be uh, tremendously uh, relevant for uh, reducing uh, maternal mortality and improving uh, pregnancy outcomes and so on. And nanotechnology, um, we're really at the beginning of a revolution there. Um, and that goes not only from, uh, from food and uh, uh, also to massive uh, ap applications, for example, for water, uh, for safe water. Food science, we, don't, we rarely discuss about it in, in uh, public health circles, but um, it's also uh, in, in an incredible transition in terms of possibilities of making food safer, cheaper, um, or unhealthier. The choices are there. And uh, we need to link up with, with agriculture, the green revolution, and, uh, um, and what we're trying to do in terms of um, public health. And then energy and material sciences, um, just to flag that uh, uh, we, we are, of course, discussing a lot about um, limitations in, um, in fossil fuel foods, but also uh, we could put water scarcity and quality under this rubric. Um, one issue that is uh, very often striking is that in public health we are kind of um, schizophrenic in our relationship with technology. It's, a, it's been a very ambivalent relationship. On the one hand, the search for the magic bullet which when I was executive director of UNAIDS, was, uh, every other week I would get a, uh, you know, an email or a letter, Dr. Piotr, if only you would do this, and that goes then for the fashion of the day, from male circumcision to uh, some new device and so on. So the search for the magic bullet uh, based on technology. And on the other hand, um, a serious technophobia that we also are having in, in public health. And uh, certainly in the tradition of global public health and in tropical medicine and international health, often uh, the paradigm was, okay, third uh, type, third rate technology for third world countries. And uh, that has been completely um, really reversed uh, by what we've seen in, in terms of uh, communication technology. Just this is from a website what I found about some data about Tanzania. You go to a typical village and uh, with very still low coverage in terms of electricity, often uh, coming from generators which are very inefficient on a large scale, um, solar panels which are there, um, very uncommon and often uh, not functioning. But when you go into the village, you see every bar has a big television screen, far bigger than I will ever have. Um, people are watching the football matches, soccer matches in, uh, in England particularly. The British competition is very followed. And um, mobile phone coverage, even in a country like Tanzania, one of the poorest in the world, and we'll hear from Hassan later on, is very high. Even with 3G mobile coverage in large urban areas, I think sometimes better than when you walk around in Manhattan. Um, so this is uh, uh, one example. And uh, when you look at the penetration of um, mobile phones in the world, we are now um, in the close to 4 billion. So out of a population of 6 billion, meaning also that many poor people have a mobile phone. And some have two and often have a, the latest version. And you see here the, the absolute explosion in this. I shouldn't exaggerate also, there are still countries with fairly low coverage, but it is really a, 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 been a dramatic change uh, in terms of uh, how we organize society and for social change, as I said. But we, when we talk about innovation, we should also think of processes. And uh, not, it's not only about products, technology that we can hold in our hands. Um, it's also um, a major developments that are in the pipeline in terms of cognitive sciences, which will become extremely important also when we think of mental health, but also aging population, understanding what's going on um, in terms of um, uh, learning collectively. Management sciences, we heard uh, about the importance of health systems, and uh, here we can learn a lot from management sciences also uh, in, 
in public health, um, we've been very schizophrenic. Again, no consumer business that is right in its mind would ever start launching a new product without some marketing research. What do we do in public health? We bring together some experts, policy makers, uh, and then in the best case, a few token uh, representatives of something, of um, people living with this or that. And, um, and then we issue the global guidelines and then we, we uh, try to implement that and then we are surprised it doesn't work. Um, so we should also make sure that not only does the marketing research is being done, but also the uh, constant feedback from what people think to adapt our programs. Um, system sciences, Linda uh, mentioned it, but also I said there's, there's a lot of innovation in terms of how communities are organizing themselves, how they cope with things, how they take, uh, you know, um, things uh, there in their own hands. And then uh, innovation in uh, financing models, for example, Gavi has been quite uh, innovative there with advanced market commitments and so on. Um, we'll see what it gives, but these are truly innovative uh, ways of doing business. So it's not only about innovation of delivery, but also uh, about in delivery of innovation, but also innovation of delivery, and we need to think of both. Um, and uh, very interesting examples that are coming up. Uh, this is an example from Bangladesh, where the Grameen Bank and Danone have joined uh, forces to um, deliver uh, healthy foods while also generating income. In this case, it's a yogurt and dairy products uh, business. Um, so that's also innovation. Um, and it's something also where um, in public health, we need to get over our aversion to work with, with companies that are driven by profit. Um, so everything we do will be affected by uh, this innovation and is already being affected, whether we like it or not. I also am addicted to my BlackBerry. Um, and that goes for major opportunities that we can have not really well exploited yet from, in terms of disease surveillance, not only diseases, but particularly risk factors and vulnerability surveillance, because that's what we should move to, I think, also going back to what Carlos said. Um, human resources. We are stuck, I think, in paradigms of uh, human resources for health, paradigms of the past. Of course, we need doctors and nurses and the various categories, but um, have we really looked at it, what the, the needs are, what, what will promote health, and what kind of human resources do we need, and how we can use, make maximum use of uh, present-day technology and uh, innovation? Disease prevention, education, um, good governance and community empowerment. We don't have the time to go into it. All will be affected. And we've seen some game changers in, the, uh, in recent years. Of course, some vaccines um, that uh, um, have really reduced uh, or changed the, uh, particularly um, some childhood diseases, but now we have also a, a vaccine that can prevent cancer. Um, showing the absurdity of the term non-communicable diseases, I think we need really some serious branding exercise there. Anything that starts with non is a non-starter, is a non-issue. Um, so, but we have a, uh, vaccines that can prevent cancer. Um, antiretroviral therapy was clearly a game changer. Without treatment for HIV infection, I don't believe we would have had this spectacular AIDS movement and this impact. It's an example also where the um, the traditional firewall between population health and prevention and individual medicine has been broken down uh, for the benefit of people. Mobile phones, I mentioned it, and social media. Um, it's a major platform when you think of an emerging uh, gay culture, for example, in Southeast Asia, it is driven largely by social media and of course also in other places. But I mentioned Southeast Asia because the gay culture had been very much underground up to now. Smoking was definitely a game changer. And gradually, and it still is, uh, and it's, it, it's the major cause of deaths in, in the world today. Um, but then the anti-tobacco movement is equally a, ga a 
game changer, but not yet to the same extent. And diet changes. Um, we saw the map of McDonald's and so on. Now, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty that we have to deal with. Um, and many uh, new technologies have, um, the risk is unclear. And traditional risk assessment uh, doesn't work, for example, for nanotechnology. We don't know yet how to, uh, to measure um, the impact of, um, of products that are based at a molecular level. We don't know. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's bad or whatever, it's just that we need to adapt our uh, assessment of this risk. And it's not enough to have a, um, a trial that measures efficacy. We need to know population-based effectiveness, but also longer-term assessment of the, of the risks. And uh, there is sometimes enormous commercial pressure to introduce new systems. And I'm not only talking about risks of a product, but also risks of um, yeah, of systems uh, that are being introduced. Um, the regulatory systems in many low- and middle-income countries are very weak, so meaning that many things come on the market that are really not, perhaps, uh, neither effective and may have risk. Risk perceptions vary enormously. Look at the debates uh, and the attitudes vis-a-vis uh, -vis genetically modified organisms in Western Europe. And, and, and in this part of the world. It's, it's absolutely different uh, for uh, historic and other reasons. There are ethical and human rights issues we need to take into account. And then let's not forget that, um, let's say, easier communication is not always used by to promote a ra rational behavior or whatever you, or to spread uh, evidence, but also is a major uh, instrument for dissemination of misinformation and anti-science. I think the most spectacular way of that is uh, the um, anti-vaccine movement, but we've even seen like um, how this had an impact what we understand, on a uh, president like President Mbeki by surfing the web and being uh, exposed to uh, AIDS denialists. But the anti-vaccine movement is growing and growing in the world including now in low- and middle-income countries, and the um, internet and web communication is really uh, a major uh, instrument and is undermining uh, child survival issue uh, attempts now in a growing way. Finally, uh, what about the challenges that we face in public health? Uh, the first one I would say is not so much about new technologies and, and, and innovation, but is making sure that existing tools, that there is equitable access to the largest extent possible all over the world. Um, we can't uh, constantly jump to the, the, the newest uh, fashion and the newest uh, technology and uh, ignore the often very low cost uh, interventions that are there. Um, secondly, there is a big issue uh, not only for technology and innovation, but in general for in global health. Who sets the agenda? Who sets the agenda? Um, is it those who are uh, developing the technologies? Is it um, business? Is it um, the agenda in function of health? And all of those have to come together. And when we define uh, innovation beyond uh, technology development, but also innovation of how to do things, then it's clear that every single um, country can learn from other countries. No country is too poor to develop innovative approaches. No country is too rich to learn from others to, uh, in how to handle um, uh, health issues. And the issue of assessing effectiveness of innovation I mentioned before is a big issue as far as I'm concerned. So access, um, yeah, I don't have time to that. Um, and then a second set of, innovation, of challenges have to do with where are the incentives? Um, market forces have been the incentives for um, innovation in individual healthcare and in healthcare provision and for disease um, management. They've not been so effective for, um, in terms of prevention and, and population based. So that's where. Um, public-private partnerships, etc., uh, and the public sector definitely have a major role to play. 
We can also um, learn from uh, individual medicine, which is uh, moving more and more towards personalized medicine. In public health, we still have one, um, you know, um, template, and that, has to, that should be good for everybody, forgetting that populations are very diverse. And with modern day technologies and information technology and the products and the, the, the learning of social science, we can be far more refined in our approaches. And lastly, so much is lost in translation because we're not engaging with people. My issue about marketing, but also in terms of what we are going to, uh, what, what people's expectations are. So in conclusion, three thoughts. First of all, very clearly, um, there's a tremendous amount of science of innovation, of technology, that uh, we can bring to public health and to global health. Uh, secondly, um, the new uh, global health concept may be better equipped to fully utilize the potential innovation uh, than classic public health because of the multidisciplinary nature of the, of the global health. And thirdly, the key is that we are proactive in setting the agenda for research, setting the agenda for access, assessing effectiveness, technology, and innovation, and equitable access. So this will be some of the issues that we can discuss, but it has to be discussed as part of the overall uh, objective of improving health for everybody. Thank you. Peter. And so for the first discussant, I'd like to uh, ask Hassan Mashinda from the Tanzania Commission for Science and Technology to join us. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by giving you the information this morning. I was uh, listening because of the jet lag. I was watching a TV. And I heard something which is uh, very interesting, that uh, the David Cameroon, the Prime Minister of UK, announced that he's going to put more resources to technology-based institution. This is not something new. You will expect from David Cameroon, who has facing a big challenge of uh, retrenching a big number of public health workers. And this is because that uh, innovation is, input, is important for human welfare, but it's also very important for economic development and competitiveness. And uh, this is something which we cannot ignore in public health, like what actually Peter has shown to us. What I'm going to discuss with you this morning is taking about so, oh, these technologies. I don't know it's on my side. Oh, no. This way. It's really to take you some of the challenges, uh, some of the challenges which Peter has outlined, which particularly focusing on who is really setting the agenda. And as you know very well, this is the classical approach of setting agenda in science, whereby the scientists are identifying the molecules, and these molecules are taken to animal trials, and then later on they're actually going to be used in, the, in human. But uh, this is a slide from uh, the president of the Global Research Alliance, uh, Doc, uh, Professor Mosheka from India. And, uh, but that is the linear approach of, uh, of approaching science. But as we know that we need to change the approach, or now the innovation is actually starting to change. It's not only, it's no longer linear, but it's also moving from, from the customers or from the user sites to inform the applied research and also to the basic uh, science. And uh, you, one of the technologies, one of those platform technologies, some of those platform technologies, particularly which have been outlined relating to information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, there is also a traditional knowledge which is existing in most of the developing countries. And we can start to see that in the future trends, some of these technologies will find its way in, uh, in public health. Uh, this is a classical example of India, which is using now the traditional technology as the way of 
bringing in back to the modern sciences. The, this thing. Again, as outlined in India, most, most of uh, the, uh, what the challenges which they are bringing together is not only that these technologies are going to be available, but they are also going to be produced in a very, very cheap way and to the level that is you cannot compare with most of, these, uh, most of the other countries. And this is what is going to be the future of the technologies which are going to hopefully to be used in the public health setting, particularly if we want to have technologies which are mainly to be, which are less costly, but also going to be more and more equitable. This is some of the developments what we're actually going to see. And I'm not going to I apologize for those who have seen this slide, but this slide is very important to show to you also in relation to when we're talking about science and technologies. This is the data which are coming from, uh, area from Tanzania and really demonstrating that uh, in most cases when we do clinical trials, we're normally interested mainly on efficacy of, these, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the products. But as you know very well that efficacy, which are mainly conducted, which is mainly generated from ideal condition, is not equal to what is available in the real life situation. Most of the decision to use these uh, technologies are mainly based on clinical uh, trials, which is not rep equal representing the, what is happening in the real life situation, whereby some issues relating to coverage, whether you are using its uh, diagnostics, compliance for those who are going to provide care and patients, these are the most important when we talk about public health uh, impact, our effective, effectiveness. Unfortunately, the current clinical trials also do not actually include some of these elements. And also, more importantly, even those drug manufacturers are not interested with these downstream issues. But these are important for public health because as you know that uh, when you have uh, these uh, low coverage or high coverage and the community, eff the community effectiveness is becoming very, very low. It's not representing what we know in terms of the drug efficacy when we actually do that in a clinical condition, in, a cl in ideal condition. And this is where the challenge of the health systems comes and even that's where we need maybe more innovation, particularly in the areas on where, how one can strengthen the health systems and whether it's actually in these areas whereby management or system thinking will maybe be able to provide the solutions for public health. And uh, what is also more important when you try to put this in terms of the equity, you will find the story is going to be completely different. And this is where the role of the social entrepreneurs or social investor may come in and trying to find what will be the best solution for the next challenges of public health. Uh, Apart from those issues which have been mentioned by Peter, the other issues which are very important, as he said clearly, that in Tanzania communication is actually fastest growing field. It's contributing to 15, the annual growth of communication sector is around 15 to 17 percent. But we are still facing challenges in terms of how one can mainstream ICT, these technologies, in a real life situation. If you are thinking about, uh, if you take example in, in health, you in an ICT, you find a number of vertical programs putting VSAT communication in the, in the same hospitals or in the same health facilities without even knowing each other. You have one program come with VSAT, another one comes with another VSAT, another one comes with VSAT, and unfortunately none of them have operational cost of making, of buying a bandwidth and this is actually posing a very important uh, challenges. So what we need to do is to find up, uh, to, to, to think in terms on how one can mainstream these technologies in the health systems in a manner that we have ICT policies in the ministries and we have also strategies and policy. 
This is also going to face a cha challenge in terms on how one is going to do technology assessment with whether it is the uh, technologies which are not purely medical oriented like GMOs as you mentioned earlier or what is going to, which is unfortunately that responsibility is lying on the environmentalist and in the, and these responsibilities are posing a big challenge in terms on how this technology could actually be used. Another problem we are facing is the low understanding of intellectual property issues among the knowledge workers. Particularly in the academia, you find that a very, very low understanding of, uh, of the IP issues. And this is becoming very important in our countries simply because that those scientists which have been trained have low understanding on these issues and they do well the time when people are talking about either protecting the intellectual property or exploiting intellectual properties with issues which are existing, and that is the most. Uh, these are some of the gaps which are which are existing, and it is very important to consider in the training of the new knowledge workers. Uh, another aspect is the training is the capacity building on commercialization. When uh, when you go to do science in most of our countries, nobody actually teach you on how can you commercialize any of the research product which you are getting. And as we know that uh, commercialization is one of the most important element if we want to ensure that science has an impact in terms of the of the growth. So this aspect is very is actually missing. The part of the innovation systems whereby you need to work together between private sector public and also civil society is very important, not only in terms of generating uh, technologies, but also to ensure a proper use of this technology. What we are seeing is also the invisible college. Invisible college is the word, is the term which is uh, come across uh, 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 from somebody called Caroline Wagner, who is talking on science in development, and this is actually a network of knowledge workers which are hidden. We actually don't see them in the institution, but through interactions and through interactions, we try to build up consensus and coming up with a solution. And this is the future of the public health and the future of the global public health. With that, thank you very much for your Hassan. And one last intervention before we take a break. Uh, Katerina Ferechu from the Catholic University in Chile will join us. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It has been a pleasure to be here. Well, um, uh, my my idea is to uh, present uh, one other uh, point of view to Dr. Piot that I really agreed in all his presentation, also in the previous discussion, and also discuss some impediment that I see to incorporate innovation uh, in health, in public health. So the the like a new concept is that. Innovation technology will originate in developing countries even more. As the, as the previous speaker mentioned, India is one of the most important probably drivers of innovation, and also China and Brazil. And uh, so if we think in the future, maybe most of the innovation will come from there. And this, uh, the companies or that are working there have to serve large populations uh, that are mainly poor populations. So we expect that the innovation that will come from these countries will be more appropriate for our population. So that's something that we have to have in mind that it will mean that uh, we may be offered uh, with a lot of innovation and uh, uh, maybe very frequent innovation. So this will be an issue for public health. Uh, the other thing that we are already seeing is that uh, this, uh, in these countries, the, the problem is how to reach uh, to the people that is still in, in rural or apartheid areas. 
So the, we are seeing today what they have been calling scale out, that it means how to get to the people. So they are with innovative uh, uh, system to, uh, to develop the, to provide the innovation to all the people. And we have to learn from that. Um, like the clinics on wheels, and they, they, there is a lot of description of things that are doing in India to serve the population in the private sector is doing that. Uh, the other thing is that the, in these countries, uh, they are using a new concept to serve these people that someone, some economists call this a frugal, that it, it says, you know, to, to simplify the, instead of engineering more and more sophisticated products that we see in Western countries, like the mobile phones becoming more and more complicated. Here, the movement goes in the other direction. How to simplify these phones to make it more and more simple? And, uh, and that, uh, uh, that has been called also reverse innovation, is to get to the simpler. And that uh, in public health, we, we've seen this today is occurring with HPV testing that is being developed in China. Uh, going from the very highly sophisticated approval in the U.S. and in use in the U.S. to very simple that we don't need electricity. So this is not, uh, this is something that is already occurring. So this we have to keep in mind that uh, is probably coming. Uh, and the other, and the other concept that I wanted to discuss is that innovation can be very disruptive for the public health programs, traditional programs managers. And I have been, uh, I am facing this situation because I, haven't, I happen to be involved in evaluating new technology. And this can be very important because in our countries, especially the ones that have centralized health system, you have to begin with the person in charge of the program. If the person doesn't accept the innovation, uh, that's it. There is no way to go beyond for the public people. The problem is that the private community will receive the innovation, and that's what's happening in many countries in Latin America. So the, pub the private sector takes the innovation, but the public one gets stuck. So, uh, well, and, and why is that? Uh, what, what happened in my country and probably in many other countries that is that uh, the uh, the programs are focused to disease, like say cervical cancer prevention. That is the example I want to uh, use today. So the person is in charge of the program for the whole life, and they are like the, it's a baby. You know, <laughs> the program is a baby, and they forget about the population, how the population is changing, how innovation can affect, and and, and that has uh, is, is a, a what I think is almost impossible that innovation will initiate with the person in charge of the program. So it has to be from another group in the Ministry of Health probably that is in charge of innovation, in reviewing innovation, because the person in charge of this program will not initiate a change. Very difficult. So, um, well, the, the other thing, the characteristics of these uh, traditional programs is that it's one program that covers the whole country that was good in the past, but today it's not, uh, it's not necessary, it's not adequate. So we have to, uh, as Dr. Piot put, put it, we have to shape uh, the programs to the population. And in a country we have diverse needs. And that is very difficult that will be done by the current program managers in Latin America. The other thing is that innovation occurs in relatively short uh, time period. And as I said, with all these huge economies, emerging economies that are very flexible, uh, innovation will come even faster. And that requires that people keep reading, and uh, reading in probably in English, that is not the language in Latin America. And also it requires some technical knowledge to be able to uh, adapt and understand what they are reading. And usually these uh, managers don't have those abilities. So those are important barriers for them also to, to, to learn about the, 
the innovation. And usually they are taught by the companies that are interested or other interest groups. Uh, so uh, the, at the end what happened is that managers felt incompetent to manage the change and instead of managing the change they fight it. And this is something that we see. Or they are taken by interest groups and that's even worse. So I wanted to give a very quick example of a cervical cancer a, a control program and I'm taking the, the less uh, the least controversial intervention that is the, uh, the change in the, in the screening because the vaccine is still with a lot of discussion that I don't want to go into. So this that is not discussed. Um, so the, the, the process of, of the change in the cervical cancer prevention uh, is, is particularly the screening began in, in the 70s when the hypothesis, they had the hypothesis that uh, an HPV could cause uh, cervical cancer. In 83 and 84, HPV 16 and 18 were discovered as the cause of cervical cancer. And in 1995, uh, an HPV DNA test uh, was uh, approved uh, and, and uh, is now in, for years has been in use in, develop, in, de in developed countries. HPV vaccine were available in 2006. So the first introducers of both innovation are developed countries and are the, uh, especially in the population who less uh, need this innovation because this uh, cervical cancer is very low. And an, an exception is Mexico that has been very innovative in incorporating this innovation thanks to the particular situation that they have very well educated people in charge of the Ministry of Health. So people that used to be the head of the Insti National Institute of Public Health became health uh, authorities. So that was very important to help Mexico to go uh, leading in Latin America in the change. So the, the question is uh, also, so who needed the innovation, who is getting it, and who is deciding? And, and th this is the problem. So uh, I think in this example, these things are upside down. So for, uh, this is just one example in my country. I am showing the health services. Health services cover a regional area, and the country is very segregated. So poor people tend to live in, in the same area, and rich people in this, another area. And here you can see. I organized the, the 27 health services by the rate of death of cervical cancer. And you can see that we have a very broad variation. The red the arrow shows the average, the national average, that is eight approximately. And, but uh, number, uh, I, the health service number one is, is in the metropolitan area uh, near the hills where live the rich people. And uh, the last health service is called Arauco, is where the Mapuche population live in southern Chile. And you can see there are two worlds, I mean, completely different. Now, the, the people in the Arauco service, they are 100% served by public health system. The people in the uh, uh, number one health service is 70% private health, 70 or 80% private hands. So we have two different uh, health systems in real life. And the innovation today is being used for people in the health service number one. And that's uh, the absurdity of all the situation. This is the same information, but breaking down by years of schooling. So, uh, the, uh, and this is the trend of cervical cancer death rate from the 90s to 2005. And you can see the blue line on top is the rate of women with less than eight years of education, with very little change and with very high rate. In green, the second line is with from eight to 12 years of education. And the red line in bottom, women with more than 12 years of education. So it's very clearly uh, related with uh, poverty and education. So the only solution, the, so our, it's very clear that we have to focus our intervention in the less educated women. 
And this is the problem because they are in the hands of the public health system where the innovation is almost impossible unless we change the brains of the people in charge. So this is an example of a study that we are just completing. This is a field trial in real life situation. You can see the impressive uh, difference in the detection capacity. This is the detection of uh, precancerous lesions, severe precancerous lesions and cancer in the same women in the general population in the metropolitan area of Chile. Uh, the same women had the two tests, and you can see the difference of HPV detection versus Papa Nicolau. And with this information, you, you think that the health authorities will decide, okay, we, we should do something with this new tool just for the high risk area. But it's very difficult to get to, for them to understand. Also that uh, talking about the uh, less complex uh, technology, we have, and in Mexico they are using this, a, the, a very simple uh, test uh, that is self-vaginal sampling. So women who have a, a problems to go for a gynecological examination, they can have the self-vaginal test, and it's as effective as a clinician obtained sample. Also, it has been demonstrated in India that if you move to HPV, it will prevent more deaths in India and probably everywhere than the current Papa Nicolau technique. So we already have the demonstrated effectiveness. So the, the thing is, uh, I think today we have to focus this in the population that you saw is, is with the highest risk. And uh, we have to also be uh, looking at the more simple techniques that are being developed in China that will drop the cost enormously. And we have to see how to standardize uh, uh, these uh, techniques to use it in the for the poor population. And today, as I see in my country, the main obstacle is the public health managers' incompetence to handle innovation. So since I am in the academia and I teach, I feel like our, our, our task is to, to train uh, public health officers to be able to absorb uh, innovation and evaluate innovation. And I think it's, this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a long session, but we're going to take a break now for 15 minutes. Um, and so if everybody would please help themselves to tea and coffee out in the entry area, restrooms or to that side of the room through those doors. Uh, and we'll be back in 15 minutes for the other uh, uh, background discussions.